This is one of those where I'm not even entirely sure what dinosaur they were going for when they made this, if indeed they were going for a dinosaur, but I believe it to be a Solidosaurus because of, you know, the spikes and because that's probably the dinosaur with this particular form of spikes that we've known about for this long. The first problem I see with it is that they have turned it into a carnivore. You see this a lot with this particular dinosaur because uh, usually the method they use to make it is to, you know, have a big hole in the front and it's hollow in the middle and they have, you know, the like carnivorous teeth are on the outside of it. But uh, there's no excuse in this case to give it essentially a postosuchus head. That said, you can't really go wrong with archosaur heads. There wasn't that much variation in the, you know, the basal form. If you have that sort of crocodile shape where it's a triangle on top and a square on the side and, you know, it's longer than it is wide and it's wider than it is tall, then you can't go very far wrong. So aside from the teeth and aside from the fact that it's giant for this animal, it's not too inaccurate because this was a basal form of the uh, armored dinosaurs like, like Stegosaurus and Ankylosaurus and all that were, were not descendants but sort of nieces and nephews of this particular dinosaur. This would have been early Jurassic. Uh, that it didn't have the beak yet. Like, it, it, it had the um, predent uh, bone down in the, uh, the jaw here, but it, it hadn't developed into a snipping tool yet. It lacks the uh, sort of archosaur characteristic going into the head. Like, really, the back legs should be straight and the back legs should be longer. That's actually where the dinosaur gets its name. When Richard Owen described it, uh, that should tell you how long ago it was discovered that Richard Owen described it himself. Uh, he wanted to name it after the long hind limb, uh, uh, but he ended up accidentally calling it rib of beef lizard because even with all the species he named and genre he named, Greek must not have been his strong suit. So back legs should be longer. They should be straight. They should be underneath the animal. You can see it's sort of got that half crocodilian posture that you see in a lot of quadrupedal toys, uh, which, I mean, that's the entire dinosaur thing, is that their legs were underneath them. That's why they were so successful as animals, because their locomotion was much better than anything else that was around at the time. So straighten the legs, put them under the creature, make the pelvis parallel to the ground, because it's an orn ornithischian, Ornithischian from the Greek. I keep saying Ornithischian because that's what I said my entire life, but it's Ornithischian. Straighten the tail, uh, make the osteoderms a little less pronounced. They weren't exactly, you know, triangular spikes jutting out of it. Straighten the forelimbs as well. This had rather long forelimbs proportionally to its hind limbs, especially compared to like Stegosaurus or what have you, uh, but they still would have had to be straight to, to carry the animal properly. And give it the proper number of toes. For really any later ornithischian, this would be accurate, but this particular one had four on every foot. Like, it was none of that little vestigial fourth toe on the back legs. It was, it was a full fourth toe. I suspect that was everything I wanted to cover. Thank you for watching. This has been Your Dinosaurs Are Wrong. Please like, comment, and subscribe, or even go to thegeekgroup.org so you can find out how you can become a member and donate, and we'll see you next time. So that was our very first episode, and boy does it show. Um, Liz remembers more about, like, where the inspiration for doing these videos came from than I do, which is to say she remembers anything. Uh, she's talked about it here in a, a Love in the Time of Chasmosaurs interview we did, but uh, yeah, we didn't expect the show to take off to the extent that it has, so I didn't, uh, I didn't do any research at all for that. <laughs> we need to essentially redo the Solidosaurus episode at some point, both to cover things that I didn't and just because the way we would do that episode now would be so much more thorough. 
and we need to bring it up to date with the monumental 2020 redescription of the animal by David Norman. So I said that you can't go too wrong with archosaur heads, and after 10 years of doing this, uh, yeah, you can. You can go very wrong with archosaur heads. I don't know what I was thinking. But we know that Solidosaurus's jaws, the, the snout and the lower jaw, should be narrow side to side, but deep up and down. And the top of the snout is, is convex when you look at it from the side. We don't have... There's debate over what ornithischians would have as far as tissues around their mouth. It seems that we have correlates for some kind of cheek hold in the food sort of a structure, but those could credibly be correlates for lips. Um, it doesn't seem to have been much of a chewer. It didn't process its food very much in the mouth before swallowing, so there might not have been much need to hold food in the mouth. But this was an animal that pulped or sheared its food, not, not really chewing, not really mastication. I mentioned the predental. We don't actually have that bone from Solidosaurus, but the dentaries, the, the frontmost jawbone, or in Ornithischians, the second to front jawbone, leaves off in such a way that it leaves room for a predental bone. Maybe a predental piece of cartilage, but uh, we can infer that a lower beak was present. The promaxillae, which are the frontmost jawbones on the upper jaw, have correlates that we would associate with a beak, with a ramphotheca, but then the Primaxil also has teeth in it, and those teeth have exposed roots. So it is thought that whatever beak was present was also partially supporting the teeth, the way that our gums support our teeth. I neglected to talk about the animal's ecology pretty much at all, but um, having such a narrow beak at the front of its mouth indicates that it would be a selective feeder. So it's, it's being picky about what it's bringing into its mouth, as opposed to an animal with a broad mouth would just be munching whatever. The osteoderms on Solidosaurus actually vary a lot. Some of them are cone-like in shape, but others are much more blade-like. There's some that are just little knobs, there's some that are more like plates. The 2020 description, redescription, uh, looked at the dermal skeleton, and that had a lot more detail, and we'll cover that at some point. So, I left out a lot of things that I really should have covered. First of all, why do I think that the toy in the episode is a Solidosaurus? Um, we didn't... I couldn't find the toy we originally had in that episode, but these are pretty similar. There are other candidates if I wanted to consider this just kind of a generic, early... early known to humans... Uh, Thyreophorin. But... I don't think these could be Hylaeosaurus because they don't look like a pine cone, and... If you look at period depictions of Hylaeosaurus, that's that's what they look like. Uh, they could maybe be Polacanthus, but there are toys like this, you know, the, the open-mouthed Chinosaur dinosaur toys that are Polacanthus, and those tend to look more like Stegosaurus. They, they don't look like this, where they just have uniform cones all over their bodies. But if you look at old models, like even museum models of Solidosaurus, they look strikingly like this toy. And there's even examples of this all the way up into the 90s. So I, I think I am justified in considering this Solidosaurus. There was a very recent discovery of an isolated rib of an animal that had conical spikes like this, and uniquely, for a Thyreophorin, the spikes were actually co-ossified with the rib. And that's a really interesting discovery, and I've seen people restore that animal, Spicomelis, as pretty much like this toy, where it's got uniform spikes all over its body. I'm... D dubious? Possibly 
unnecessarily skeptical of that restoration, but we'll cover that whenever we wind up doing a, a redo properly of Solidosaurus. I didn't talk about the etymology of Solidosaurus at all. I didn't talk about the history very much at all. I, I think Owen's name for this animal was supposed to be emphasizing its terrestriality because the formation that Solidosaurus comes from is most famous for marine or at least coastal animals. And Solidosaurus doesn't have flippers. It's clearly not an aquatic creature. Solidosaurus had what's called palpebral bones over the eyes. They're those eyebrows that you see in a lot of ornithischians. The back of the head should really have more of a crown or, or border of spikes, as opposed to what you see in these toys where it's, it's just the back of the head transitioning into the neck with, with no ornamentation. Again, that part of the dermal armor was revised in the redescription in 2020. We will cover that in a future video. When I was talking about the hind feet, I didn't mention that they actually do have a fifth foot bone, but it didn't have a toe on it. Solidosaurus might be the earliest known facultatively quadrupedal ornithischian. I say facultatively because in 1999 a trackway was described from Poland that seems to show a Solidosaurus-like animal walking only on its hind legs. Now that's not without precedent. We have seen plenty of ornithischians that are facultative bipeds but can walk quadrupedally if they want to. And there are even historical depictions showing Solidosaurus at least standing bipedally, uh, sort of like a scaly kangaroo because it's period artwork so of course it's sitting on its tail. But bipedal Solidosaurus, not without precedent in the art. Another 21st century development, at least something that wasn't formally described until the 21st century, we actually have soft tissue preservation from this animal. The, the skin, the scales in between the osteoderms, which is just normal dinosaur skin round tuberculate pavement. We also have uh, some preservation of keratin sheaths on the spines themselves. Probably getting sick of me saying this, but in a future video, we're going to talk about the paleobiology, the ecology, much more about the history. There's, there's a lot of history with Solidosaurus leading up to the redescription in 2020, which broadly is more of a clarification than like a radical change in its appearance, but it does change. We're going to put these addenda onto all of the re-uploaded old videos as we go through them. Hopefully most of them won't have this much material that we missed, but we'll see. So thank you all for watching this re-upload of Your Dinosaurs Are Wrong. Please remember to like, comment, and subscribe, and we will see you next time. We would like to send a special thank you to these individuals who have gone above and beyond to support this show. We could not have done it without you. Thank you.